Two friends, two pastors, two theologians, pursuing spiritual life by exploring the scriptures in conversation with the fathers. I'm Dr. Wes Arblaster. And I'm Dr. Ethan Smith. And we are Mysterion. Well, good uh, afternoon, good morning, whatever it is happens to be for you. This is the Mysterion Theology Podcast. And as we said last week, we've got a special uh, episode today. We are having a conversation with Nathan Gilmore, um, who is many things, Howdy. many things, but most of all, I would have to say for me, he's a very old and dear friend. Um, Nate and I went to Milligan together. We studied philosophy together at Milligan and yes. also did some biblical studies there. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, what did you end up graduating with from Milligan? Uh, Nate, what was your degree? Uh, uh- Oh, my degree. I, I was a double major in uh, English and humanities with a Bible minor. Okay, that's right. Okay, good. And then we went off to seminary together. We t- when we studied, uh, we yes. studied, uh, um, and you, you, uh, your emphasis there was in uh, scripture, right? New Testament, or yeah, I was in biblical studies. I wrote my, uh, I, and and this was the beginning of a trend as far as my, you know, sort of capstone projects. I wrote a thesis on. Uh, how William Blake can help us to see things in Ezekiel that we wouldn't see without him. And that, uh, that, that tradition of, you know, crossover, you know, literature theology projects followed me through a couple more graduate degrees after that. And all during this time, and Ethan and I were, I'm sorry, Nathan and I were very good friends. And yes. uh, we took a lot of courses together and actually just grew theologically and spiritually together um, kind of took that journey for almost 10 years together. Um, which yeah. is, and it's a wonderful thing to be able to talk with you again. I know that you've done things since then, and we'll, we're going to get into those, but I want to say, first of all, I'm blessed to be your friend, and I'm, I'm glad that we got a chance yeah. to reconnect after all these years. So, Thank you, Wes. Thank you. Yeah. So um, uh, we're going to go and talk a little bit more about who you are, what you come from, but just to kind of introduce the episode, we're bringing you on today to talk more about um, spiritual reading of scripture, um, and mm-hmm. just have an open conversation with you about um, that the early, the father's ways of approaching scripture to uh, in relationship to other ways of approaching scripture. And we're just going to kind of see where the conversation goes. It might get nerdy, it might not, but we'll just see, right? We'll see how it goes, and just kind of um, have that uh, free and open um, conversation um, that way. But um, moving on, I'll go ahead and say that uh, Ethan is usually very good about warning listeners that uh, it's going to get nerdy. I usually don't know that I've gone there. Someone has to, uh, you know, let me know that I've I've, I've been speaking in, uh, you know, strange vocabularies for the last five minutes and no one has stopped me. Uh, So, I mean, if I if I go there, listeners, uh, just understand that's the way I am. I'm really not trying to impress anyone. I just can't keep track of the way I speak sometimes. (laughs) Well, you know, before we, we get going, uh, people should know more about Nate, because if all they know is that they're, he's, you're a friend of Wes, they might have a negative opinion of you. <laughs> right. you know? So, so you, went, you, you went on and you studied uh, literature, right? Yeah, yeah. After I finished my uh, uh, master's degree in uh, Old Testament there in Tennessee, I went to the University of Georgia. And in 2002, I defended a master's thesis uh, exploring the ways that uh, John Milton and Amelia Lanyard, two uh, 17th century English poets, uh, can help us to read the Jesus narratives in the Synoptic Gospels and, you know, making the case that, you know, they are basically anticipating things poetically that the very dogmatic and very proposition-centered theological disputes of the 17th century really hadn't gotten to yet, uh, but that Milton and Lanyard got there first. And then, I went on from there and uh, started my PhD work uh, not long after my son Micah was born in 05. Uh, And then my dissertation there, uh, which I wrote when I was already a a professor at Emmanuel College, uh, made the argument that uh, Spencer and Shakespeare and Milton, specifically the Fairy Queen and uh, Shakespeare's Roman plays and Paradise Lost, are actually making moves in theology uh, that, you know, later on surface in writers like David Bentley Hart, uh, George Lindbeck, Stanley Hauerwas, so on and so forth. So like I said, I mean, I I have been working the the theology literature crossover my entire academic career, 
Uh, I like to tell people that if I'm in a room full of Shakespeareans, I'm the guy who went to seminary. If I'm in a room full of theologians, I'm the guy who was the English major. So I'm always kind of on the, the edge of the room while everyone else is having the insider conversation. So I'm a, I'm a perennial dabbler. Jack of all trades. You're, you're also, indeed, indeed. You're also uh, uh, the expert in, in podcasting. Right, you've been running this fantastic yes, podcast yes. for many years, Christian <laughs> Humanist podcast. Yes, the Christian Humanist podcast, uh, which you can find on uh, iTunes and other uh, podcast distributors. Uh, we started that in '09, so we've been going for about 12 years. I'm actually on hiatus right now, just because uh, with my additional responsibilities, both my kids are uh, doing digital school, so I've been helping them with their classes, which has been a a, a bigger time investment than I anticipated. So the guys on the show, you know, let me take off until May when, you know, they're done with school. Uh, and actually Matthew Block, who is a really wonderful uh, conversationalist, I've been listening to their episodes, has been on there. But Christian Humanist, you know, started out with uh, Michael Farmer and David Grubbs and me uh, just having conversations about, you know, our, our, our slogan on the show is, uh, literature, philosophy, theology, and other things human beings do well. And, you know, our approach over the years has been that even if something isn't to our immediate taste, we would go into every episode and we take turns, the three of us deciding what the subject of conversation is going to be. We would go into the episode trying to find something that whatever the artifact is at hand does well. So even if it's a film that we don't especially like, we try to find something that's worth praising in it, even if it's a theology that we think is wrongheaded, we try to find something good going on in it. And that approach, I mean, you know, hasn't made us big, uh, but it has garnered us, you know, a, a very loyal base of listeners. Uh, and, you know, we, we love every one of them. Uh, over the years, we've also added Christian Humanist Profiles, where we interview recent authors. The Christian Feminist Podcast uh, started around 2013, uh, we've got the City of Man, which is politics and faith, the Book of Nature, science and faith. We've got the Sectarian Review, which is a bizarre, quirky cultural criticism and theology show. Uh, we've got Core Curriculum, where we read very slowly through, you know, the, uh, oh, which, which one is it? The Columbia University Great Books list. We've done uh, the Iliad, the Odyssey, Plato's Republic, and Sappho's poetry so far, and we're working through... Uh, the Nicomachean Ethics right now. We're not going in order, by the way, because we're going to backtrack to the symposium next, Michael tells me. Uh, and then, I mean, one of them that I have a, a special fondness for, uh, Michael Farmer and uh, Josh Altman show for one of his friends from college. Uh, they do a show once a month called Before They Were Live, where they have theological conversations about Disney animated movies. So, you know, we've got about eight or nine, uh, you know, different shows going in any given week. There might be anywhere from two shows to seven shows that go live. And uh, like I said, I mean, you know, we love our listeners because they write in with these, you know, phenomenal questions and, uh, you know, really kind of keep us going uh, even when pandemics and things make us feel like we shouldn't be going anymore. Mm -hmm. As 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 our uh, listeners uh, can see, Nathan is an interesting fellow. <laughs> <laughs> and has lots of interesting conversations with lots of interesting people. And believe it or not, I mean, mm -hmm. Christian humanist uh, profiles, it's unbelievable some of the people that you have a chance to interview. I mean, these are the people yeah, that... Yeah, I can't... Are, I'd are, like, like people want to say no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 It's, it's I, I've true. had Stan Hauerwas on there a couple times. I've had Walter Brueggemann. I think N.T. Wright's been on five times. Um, and then, you know, that's just the theology world. I've also had, you know, Machiavelli scholars, Milton scholars, Shakespeare scholars. I've had uh, art historians. Uh, I've had, trying to think of who all else. And then really, I mean, some of them that I, I've really come to enjoy these last few years are scholars who are not internationally renowned names. Uh, and one of them who immediately comes to mind is a philosopher called Stephanie Semler, uh, who honestly, I mean, uh, her book came up on a, a Twitter feed that I was following on the time from whatever press she was writing on. I actually got off Twitter back in June, so I, I can't remember what the Twitter feed was called. Um, but it's called A Person as a Lifetime. And what that book does is it crafts a feminist Aristotelian ethical philosophy, which I didn't think could be done, but she does it so well. <laughs> 
uh, that her episode is one that I always try to point people to because, you know, like I said, I had never heard of Stephanie Semler, but I think everyone should hear about Stephanie Semler. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's really great. It's really great that you're able to speak with, with all these people, such a diverse uh, uh, confluence of voices, you know. Uh, it's fun. I, I have a great time at it. I really do. Yeah. And, and to, to the, the nerd to listen to Mysterion, you know, all of Nathan's podcast stuff is great, but if you especially love to hear the scholars whose books you read interviewed, Nathan, I think you're, you are the best interviewer in the podcast world theolo theologically. Oh goodness. Oh goodness. I'm you're going to make me blush. Serious. Like I, uh, <laughs> you know, when I was doing my research, I was working a grunt job and I would listen to those and you uh -huh. ask really sharp, great questions that don't go the typical route that a lot of the interviews when guys go on book tours or gals go on book tours. Oh, sure, sure. And so that's always really great. So just so people know, check them out. Those interviews are fantastic. Yes, I make I make N.T. Wright talk about Dante with me. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> so, uh, you know, being, being someone who, you know, is uh, trained in reading... Uh, literature um, and not actually literature from various ages. I mean, even though, you know, your oh, yeah, yeah. dissertation research and stuff is primarily on like Renaissance literature, right? No? Yeah. English Renaissance, 17th century mainly, although I do dip yeah. into Spencer. But you have mm -hmm. a wide range, have a, many conversations about people who uh, read, uh, just read differently, right? Um, yeah. From various historical and cultural contexts. And you know, right. you are also a listener of Mysterium Theology podcast, and you hear what we are, uh, you know, trying to encourage people to do in relation yeah. to a very specific form of literature, right? Reading scripture. Uh -huh. um, yes. And uh, I think it would just be a great conversation for us to have with you about um, what you hear and in, in what we are doing and encouraging, um, what mm -hmm. questions come to your mind, and then also how that relates to other ways of reading. Um, and just kind of have a sure, sure dialogue about that. Um, because you know, I'm yeah, like, yeah. So go ahead. Do you want to say something? Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> no, no, dig in there. Okay. Finish your thought. So, you know, oftentimes, you know, the main, the main folks that we're talking to our sort of assumed audience, um, are people that have an interest in reading scripture and they have some conviction that scripture mm -hmm. is a, it's a holy book, but what do we what do we do with that? What does that mean for yes. us, right? Um, and so I think one of the things mm -hmm. that, and uh, some of this is biographical, I think for both, um, and I think you can identify with this some, um, but being someone who's went to college and did scriptural study, biblical studies, um, you know, for, was trained in mm -hmm. biblical studies. Um, that question was always sort of a really, um, it was a difficult question to answer. And there were, there were lots of ways that when we began to learn how to read scripture from, um, you know, academically um, mm -hmm. in the way that we were trained by modern biblical scholarship, this question about it being a holy text um, right. sort of hovered in the atmosphere. Um, but mm -hmm. I had a very difficult time trying to figure out how that relates to what I'm learning to do here by approaching sure. the text as a, like we might say as a historical artifact or something that was, you know, written by certain authors in a certain context to a certain audience. Like that's the way we learn. So yeah. how do these go together? Right. Um, how do we pay attention to scripture as something that is indeed um, written by human beings um, written in mm -hmm. a historical context? What do we do that with that? And at the same time, acknowledge that the scriptures are something else there's something beyond that right um it is a holy text sure sure um this it is um yeah in some it is the it is the words of god and the words of christ in some way so anyway that absolutely that's a that's a that's that's one of those questions i think we're trying to explore uh, especially mm -hmm. in the last five or six episodes um as we're as we're learning from origin how to approach scripture as i would say as a holy as a holy book um, Ethan, am I leaving anything out of this so far in, in my description of what we're trying to do in terms of uh, scripture or spiritual reading of scripture? No, I think that's good. I mean, uh, you know, for us, the question is, what does a spiritually engaged reading of the text look like in our time and place? Mm -hmm. uh, we don't always thematize like 
in our time and place. We just want to do it. See if we can throw a live option yeah. out there for people. And I don't know, maybe, mm -hmm. maybe today we, we sit back and talk about it, but I, I want to like, just give Nathan maybe the floor to articulate questions or comments or whatever he's got. Yeah. 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 And, and I know you guys, I mean, prefer the Greeks, but I'm going to start Latin here. Uh, there's a little throwaway episode in Exodus uh, where before the people leave for the wilderness of Sinai, uh, it says that they went to their name neighbors and the neighbors gave them their gold and their valuable things. And uh, St. Augustine in his book uh, on Christian teaching or De Doctrina Christiana, if you want to use the important sounding Latin title, says that that should be the believer's approach to pagan learning, for lack of a better phrase, right? And I've, I've kind of tried to take that approach to uh, all kinds of learning, whether it be scientific learning or philosophical or historical and really kind of take, uh, you know, what might have had, you know, beginnings. I'm trying not to say O-R-I-G-I-N because it sounds like O-R-I-G-E-N. So pardon me if I hang up on my words. But um, that has beginnings that aren't necessarily for the building up of the faithful, but, but we nonetheless plunder them and still use them to build up the faithful, right? And that's kind of how I approach, you know, modern biblical studies. So, I mean, for folks who aren't as aware of this project, I mean, it, it grows out of the Enlightenment and uh, in sort of high modernist circles, especially in German universities. And, I mean, it is hard to deny that, you know, when you look at its early figures, uh, it is there so that it can basically decenter Scripture as the site of authority and install in its place uh, certain historical procedures, certain historical practices, a certain mode of reasoning uh, that therefore stands above the scriptures and passes judgment on the scriptures. That approach I'm really not interested in because, I mean, that is a theological question. That's a philosophical question. And I think the answer to that philosophical question is, uh, you know, anything that, you know, stands above the scriptures and says, the scripture must answer to me or else I won't answer or else I won't heed its counsel, uh, you know, anything that takes that approach, I mean, is, is idolatrous, right? But when we plunder it, when we take it, uh, take it captive, take captive every thought, it just occurred to me, I should have used that phrase from St. Paul, right? Uh, when we do that, I think that some of the things that are possible there really do have with our, really do speak to our own historical moment, like Ethan was mentioning earlier, because so much, so many of the people with whom we engage, uh, whether the people who are already in the pews or the friends of those people in the pews or people who we just meet, you know, uh, not as often in the last 14 months, obviously, but those who we meet out in public, um, their education has been an education from a cosmic perspective, right? So, I mean, you know, one of the things that Ethan said that is, is very, very good uh, on his solo episode a couple or three weeks back, I forget exactly when it was, uh, is that when the ancients did theology, they didn't start from that cosmic perspective. And I think that, you know, if we remember that, we can read Origen not as a defective modern theologian, but as someone who is coming from that third century, right? I think also it is good to put Origen and the other ancients into conversation with more cosmic perspectives, Again, not so that one of them can supplant the other, but so that they can all become part of that exchange of ideas uh, so that we can have those conversations with the people we minister to. And, you know, I, I realize that, you know, I, I am myself talking from a mile high in the sky right now, but just to bring it down to earth for a moment, uh, you know, I mean, just this last Sunday uh, after church service, you know, someone who had uh, been in Sunday school, but didn't have time to pose a question, came to me and, you know, had questions about, uh, you know, can God forgive without temple sacrifices? And, you know, one of the things that, that I was able to do is, you know, again, situating things in a historical moment, I brought her to, you know, the, uh, the, the second half of the book of Isaiah, which is coming out of that exilic uh, context. And I said, all right, you know, there hasn't been a temple for about 50 or 70 years at this point, there won't be a temple for another hundred years at this point. And yet God sends this word through Isaiah that I have forgiven your sins. So the temple is very important, but you know, one of the things that, you know, you can, 
bring to a question like that, just as, you know, the immediate example that comes to mind is that, you know, in that historical moment, uh, you know, there's still a message of divine forgiveness, even though there is not any physical structure called the temple. And even though, you know, Jesus of Nazareth is not going to be born for several centuries, right? Now, is that the only way to go about it? I mean, first of all, I'm allergic to anyone who says that this is the only way to do much of anything. I'm always looking for two or three other ways to think about things, to read things, to interpret things. Um, and I'm sure that there are other ways that, you know, someone else would have answered that question, right? Uh, but the fact that I had that at my disposal, uh, and these moths are dive bombing me like crazy. I don't know what's going on. But um, because I had that as, at my disposal, again, uh, you know, as an elder of that church and as the teacher of that Sunday school class, uh, I was able to give her an answer uh, that, you know, was not, you know, aimed at people with graduate degrees in theology and biblical studies. Uh, she decidedly does not, uh, uh, but that nonetheless are satisfying to her, uh, to her curiosity. Does that make some sense? Yeah, I think so. I mean, the, 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 the large thrust of what you're saying is, is that, you know, biblical studies, modern biblical studies, um, brings a lot to the table and gives us resources and, and ways in which we can engage the scriptures that bring genuine insight into our spiritual lives and the spiritual questions that we have, the things that we wrestle with. And while you don't, you don't want to say, okay, this, this a framework that says, I'm only going to read scripture um, through a lens of whatever modern or contemporary scholars tell me scripture is or tell me what scripture means. Yeah. I'm not going to do that, but I right. am going to look at some of the modern historians and the modern biblical uh, scholars and really draw from them to help me understand scripture. Does that have merit? Like you want to suggest that it does. I mean, that, that's yeah, what yeah. I mean. Uh, and, and moreover, I, I think that rather than supplanting uh, spiritual reading, I think that the way that I try to do it, and of course, you know, whether I'm successful or not, that's not for me to say, that's for other people to say. But what I am trying to do there is not to supplant spiritual reading in the tradition of, you know, Clement or Origen or whoever else, but rather to pay closer heed and attend more closely to the relationship between the literal and the spiritual, right? I mean, one of the things that you guys have been doing so well uh, in your series on origin is noting that, you know, his commentary is really, really concerned with the subjects and verbs and the tenses and the orders and all of the very detail oriented things that, that a careful biblical reader attends to. Right. And from there emerges the spiritual truth. Right. What I am interested in with modern biblical scholarship, again, is not to uh, minimize the importance of scripture, which, you know, is the stated purpose of certain modern biblical scholars, I'm not going to deny that, but rather, again, to plunder it and to use the kinds of attention that that teaches us to pay in order to turn around then and to explore other avenues for spiritual reading, right? So, I mean, you know, uh, you know, when I think of, you know, the, the multiple senses of scripture, you know, my go-to uh, is not origin first, although, you know, it's been nice to hear you guys talk about him, uh, but it's Dante, right, and his letter to Big Dog. Uh, actually con grande in Italian, but I call him big dog because that's what it means. Uh, and, you know, in that letter, he says that he has written, he, Dante, has written the Commedia, the Inferno and the Purgatorio and the Paradiso, so that it does what scripture is doing. Namely, it has not one meaning, but at least, he, also, he does say at least four different levels of meaning, right? The literal and the allegorical and the moral and the anagogical, Right. Uh, so, I mean, you know, when I teach that poem to my students over at Emmanuel College and when I read it on my own, uh, you know, those different levels are always operating there. Uh, and when I study the history, for instance, of uh, 14th century Florence, it gives me a different and usually an enriching view on the literal reading that's going on in that poem. And I think likewise, you know, to study carefully the historical and the literary conventional and, you know, all of these other things that go along with biblical scholarship, right? Uh, when it comes to 
first century AD Palestine or eighth century BC Jerusalem or exilic life, uh, you know, for the diaspora Jews, right? I think that those things open up things for us on the literal level so that other things can emerge when we do this spiritual reading. So, I mean, you know, I, 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 I have, uh, I've offered my opening apologia, uh, you know, Ethan, is your heart strangely warmed? Oh yes. Yes. Uh, well, first thing <laughs> I want to say is, uh, that image of plundering the Egyptians, uh, origin, uh, says that before Augustine, uh, in, in a, a letter, I can't remember who the letter is. Okay. To, okay. But he talks specifically about very good. I, so, yeah, so I, I want to answer on, on two levels, like real quickly, because I think you made some yeah. really great points that I'm totally sympathetic with. First, like pastorally, just the use of scripture in church, the way people are geared mm -hmm. in our world, just how we're formed. Uh, having that, those, the modern historical knowledge where we can tell people those kinds of things, put things in order, so often yeah. draws people in, whether it's a curiosity or it solves an issue. And so, so very often, that's the very first move you need to do to get attention, to help people out. So mm -hmm. I totally agree. And then if I could step back and just talk about, uh, so to speak, the theological underpinnings of, of what we do in Mysterion is yeah. a lot of it's actually rooted in very historical study of Jewish mysticism, ancient Jewish mysticism, even pre-Rabbinic Jewish mysticism. And it was when I was in graduate school and I, I was exposed to that through Father Silvio, who we've had on here. And I thought, oh, my gosh, this changes everything about how I see the New Testament. And then it began to change how I see sure. the church fathers. And it was a historical contextualization that did that. And that for me as a modern person, mm -hmm. it walked me to that place where all of a sudden spiritual and allegorical readings made sense. But me as a modern person, I needed... Some of these guys, they're called the new, uh, the new uh, history of religion school. They were doing work on, on pseudepigrapha of visions and Christology through, you know, Jewish texts and New Testament and even what's called Gnostic. Yeah. Reading all that literature we don't read in the ancient world, and then mm -hmm. suddenly, you know, I used to say it seemed to me that the ancient rabbis were doing one thing. The New Testament was a little bit different, and then the church fathers are way over here, and then this kind of historical study allowed me to see actually there is a deep consonance between all three of those groups to the extent that they even are three determinate groups. But so, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think for us, it's almost indispensable to have that, to get us there. Now there might be some people who, who aren't formed that way. And you know, their life with scripture is almost always already this sort of Christ seeking spiritual reading. Um, they sure. can be deepened in those ways, but I think so often, for us, it does start exactly where you say it, it sometimes starts. It's super helpful. I read that literature. Uh, I plunder it for my for my preaching, for my scholarship, for all of it. So mm -hmm. I just want to say yes. And that helps, it helps me tell the story of Mysterion a little bit. The, the emphasis on theophany and temple that we do so much that we cue in on mm -hmm. actually comes from historical studies opening our eyes suddenly to see these things and all of a sudden seeing we would not be able to see the, the the patristics as guides to scripture the way we could had we not encountered that stuff. And sure, so sure. it's like a ladder you climb up. We're not talking about it all the time, but we really needed that. I, I, I really needed that ladder and it was a historic modern historical project that yeah, provided yeah. the ladder. And, and, and one, one author that I, I recommend, and it, it's not a biblical scholar, and unfortunately, uh, Martin Scorsese has made him controversial in ways that are stupid when he should be controversial in ways that are a lot smarter is uh, Nikos Kazantzakis' novel, The Last Temptation of Christ. Uh, because what you just narrated, Ethan, I mean, that that inner relationship between, uh, you know, pre-Rabbinic and Rabbinic mysticism and the political upheaval of the first century in Palestine and whatever is going on psychologically with you know jesus of nazareth and you know all of these sorts of things i mean are all just blending together and you know banging up against each other in that novel i happen to be teaching it right now over at emmanuel college which is why it's on my mind but uh you know what you just narrated right now makes me think that you know absolutely read the historians absolutely read the scholarship uh but you know if you have a chance to take in that novel don't watch scorsese's film it stinks <laughs> 
Uh, but if you have a chance to read that novel, it really is a, a, a tremendous, um, I mean, it, it, it's an intellectual and a spiritual discipline, right? Because I mean, it, it, among other things, and there's so much going on in that novel, I, I really do love it. Uh, but it makes you confront, I mean, what does the verb to tempt mean when it comes to Jesus of Nazareth? And, you know, Kazan Zakis goes in a very determinate direction with it, and I'm not going to spoil it because I want our listeners to go read it. Uh, I don't agree with him, but he makes me answer the question. And that for me, I mean, that's, that's what really makes a book interesting is not that I like the answers, but that it poses the question that I wouldn't be able to pose unless I read the book. Yeah, and I would say in addition to that, I think one of the things um, that we try to encourage um, with Mysterio, and it's something that really brought some insight um, into how I read scripture, and so I really want to encourage um, other people um, to embrace, is this really, this really powerful consonance between the way that the fathers understand the human being, their, you know, what we call their mm -hmm. anthropology, and the way that they read the scripture. And what they see, the, what they see, how, how they see the scripture giving voice to uh, to to Christ, right? That Christ speaks through mm -hmm. the scriptures to us, and there's such a strong consonance there that I think that was one of the things that I think that um, being raised in 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 biblical studies through a, largely a modern lens, reading this. Um, yeah. I was looking for the proper method and you guys, I mean, you remember these classes as well as I do, um, um, Nate, where we were trying to go, we were going back and forth between what we would say the modern approach versus the postmodern approach, various postmodern approaches, sure, sure. Very, uh, you know, method, mm -hmm. hermeneutics, like all of these kinds of questions. Right. And sure. um, what all of that sh shares in many ways is they're looking for the right key that is in some sense outside of the human human being. Uh, now, I know we could talk more about it. Like okay. you know, there's a lot going on in cultural studies and all of that that want to bring in the human sure, cultural sure. context, but still there's a sense in which um, what, why, what, what I found in reading the, the way that the fathers uh, read scripture is this profound personal engagement that is just entire is shaped profoundly by their ascetic and spiritual practices that in such a way becomes the crucible their spirit their spiritual life how who they see themselves to be is the crucible mm -hmm. through which the 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 scriptures give voice in 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 in, 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 in a way that's not you know, what's the right lens through which we read scripture? Uh -huh. Like, did they just don't operate that way? And I'm not quite sure. I'd really be interested in hearing what you have to say about, for example, mm -hmm. Dante and some of these, these later interpreters, because it seems to me like yeah. there's, there's consonance between them, but there's also differences. You know, the, what, what I find in the fathers, um, what I don't find in the fathers is ideas. Oh, there's four levels you know, or there's uh -huh. four ways of approaching, you know, and then there's this and there's this and there's this. They don't, they don't tend to do that at all. It's very much a, uh, as they dig into scriptures, they discover these dimensions of themselves um, in a way mm -hmm. that's not, um, I would say, formal at all. Um, okay. Uh, so I, I'd be, I don't want to be interested in hearing your response to that. Um, but yeah, that, so in, that's in one the, thing I want to encourage, I guess, in, in, in how we approach how we learn from the fathers about reading scripture. Yeah. So for a little bit of a literary context, I mean, you know, the, the four levels that I mentioned before that you find in Dante uh, is not in a systematic treatise and it's not even in the Commedia, but it's in a letter uh, to Con Grande, who was one of his patrons. So he is asking for money. Uh, and, you know, because that, well, I mean, you know, uh, one thing that uh, I've had to wrestle with uh, over the years is this, sort of romantic notion that, you know, poetry and money don't, don't have anything to do with each other. And, you know, of course, my response is that, I mean, if you look at history, poetry and money have always held hands. It's just looked different in different eras, right? You're either trying to sell copies to a book reading public, or you are trying to find a patron to fund your poetry, right? But, or you're independently wealthy, like some of these poets who pretend they don't need money. But that's another question entirely. 
in that letter though, I mean, he is laying out, you know, something that really emerges a lot more uh, deliberately and a lot more spiritually in the Commedia itself. And especially in the, the middle section of it called the Purgatorio. And, you know, one of the things that happens in the Purgatorio is that uh, as Dante has his sins uh, purified, right? Uh, a couple things happen. One of them is that he finds that uh, he is able to ascend Mount Purgatorio much more readily uh, because they are not wearing him down, weighing him down or wearing him down, either one. The other thing that he realizes is that he is able to see and to hear things that he couldn't see and hear before precisely because his own sins are not keeping him from receiving as a gift the things that God wants to give to him. So, I mean, as late as the 14th century, at the very least, and I'd argue it goes further than that as well, you know, there is this strong tradition in Christian poetry that, uh, you know, still carries forth that, that notion of, uh, you know, the, the spiritual journey, uh, you know, the, the homo viator tradition, uh, as Michael Farmer so loves to call it, uh, that epistemology, you know, to use an anachronistic term, because people really didn't start talking about epistemology so much later as a separate thing, is always connected to a spiritual journey. Uh, what you can see, what you can hear is always a function of, uh, you know, for, for again, I, I'm using very modern terms for medieval realities, but it's a function of your moral life and your spiritual life uh, more than it is a set of universal and constant human capacities, right? Um, and I think that, you know, one of the things about, you know, certain modern thinkers like, you know, Alistair McIntyre, who I, who I often go to, um, is that, I mean, his work, among other things that it's doing, and of course, I mean, he's, he's a wildly complex thinker, so I don't want to, you know, reduce him to this one point. But one of the things that, that McIntyre does so nicely is brings that tradition of spiritual development, although he doesn't use that phrase, into a modern historicist framework, right? Uh, he says that, you know, I mean, uh, the big error of, uh, you know, high modern epistemology is that it assumed that human nature is a static thing rather than something on a journey. And, you know, if you think of yourself as having a human nature that never changes, you come up with a very different picture of scripture reading, among other things, than you do if, you know, as you guys are saying, you think of the soul as on a journey uh, where sometimes you swerve towards God and sometimes you swerve away from God. And those are ultimately the most important swerves that you can narrate, not the ones that involve formal education, not the ones that involve the acquisition of new vocabularies. Um, and so, I mean, you know, uh, like I said, I mean, you know, I want to, uh, you know, I, I am a, a, an utter magpie intellectually. So, I mean, I want to, I want to get everything that origin has to offer. I also want to get all the modern stuff I can, and I want to put it all together. So, you know, that's my, uh, I, and, and I, and I do recognize that, you know, Augustine would call that curiositas more than likely. Uh, but you know, uh, I would also want to have that conversation with Augustine because I, I think that it's not as simple as he makes it. And you can tell I've read more Augustine than I have of the Greeks. I'm sorry, guys. I, <laughs> I'm, I'm falling short of the uh, Mysterion ideal here of the, uh, of the good uh, Greek patristic reading. Oh, and you're not even approaching the Aramaic, which is where we would really like to settle that's down. That's true. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I have only barely even dabbled in the Aramaic fathers. Yeah. Again. Uh, there we go. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry about that. I wanted to be sensitive to 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 all of it. So I think one of the one of the questions um, I, I would want to ask then is yeah, you know, we're we are trying to revive in some ways not only a, a, a patristic way of reading scripture but also a patristic anthropology. We want to say this is okay. What, this yeah. is what human beings are. I mean, we uh -huh. are we do have these three um, dimensions to us and, and they're fundamental and it's not exhaustive, of course. I mean, we could, um, but we want to operate and, and encourage people to be thinking about human life on these three levels of, mm -hmm. of the flesh, of the body, of the soul, 
and then also of ultimately of the heart um, or the spirit. Mm -hmm. And yeah. you being someone, again, who's well versed in many, many different eras and periods and recognize the complexity of even introducing this idea as a helpful um, sure. way of understanding ourselves. I'm curious about your feedback regarding that. Um, what about it do you find um, maybe helpful or compelling? What kinds of, what would make you hesitate um, as we put forward what we would say is a sort of a general outline or sketch of what the fathers say the human person is? Yeah, so let, let me start with hesitations and then I'll go on to sing praises. Um, you know, my hesitation is that I think that there is a temptation, and I'm going to call it a temptation because I, I I, I think that it's, it is something that we can do or not do. It's contingent. I don't think it's necessary. Uh, but I think that, you know, what we talked about briefly before, I mean, the modern biblical studies and theological academy has a tendency towards territory claiming, right? Um, so, I mean, you know, the, the, the joke that I like to tell my friends in the literary studies world is that, you know, when we go to a conference, we say, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm reading Shakespeare's Henry V and I'm demonstrating that, you know, John Calvin's institutes book four uh and the shifts that he's making to just war theory you know are making a change from the monastic confessional manuals into something that more that's more rule-based and that you know hal represents someone who is opportunistically you know exploiting that change to increase his own power base and i'm drawing from you know six different realms of study and you know the people at the Shakespeare conference are just saying, you know, that's great. I had never thought about bringing Calvin into this. You know, more ingredients in the stew. We love it. Um, when you go to a theology conference, uh, it's something more along the lines of, uh, you know, your patristic reading of John is wrong because you're ignoring the 19th century German approach. I will destroy you with a fierce hatred burning with the fire of a thousand suns, and you will regret that you ever crossed me, patristic boy. Uh, now, it's not quite that simple, although sometimes I'm not convinced that it ain't. Uh, but, you know, one of the things that, you know, I think that Mysterion sometimes trends into, and again, this is not a universal thing, this is something that occasionally rears its ugly head, is that sometimes you guys, you know, when you talk about modern scholarship, you know, you'll, you'll drop, you know, of course it's a blessing, but then you'll spend 10 minutes talking about why you shouldn't listen to it. <laughs> and you know um not every episode not even most of every episode but sometimes that that dismissive approach uh you know gets in there now as far as singing praises this is what i'm a lot more interested in i think that you know what you guys are doing uh resonates very nicely with uh the work of someone i, I started reading maybe four or five years ago and i've, I've really kind of been you know trying to reread him this year uh but it's a french philosopher he calls himself a historian of philosophy but his historiography is is tendentious i'll put it that way uh but his name is uh, pierre ado and you know the first book of his that i read is called what is ancient philosophy and the argument that he makes is that the christian monastic tradition is in some very real ways inheriting uh, not only what the Stoics are doing, but also what the Aristotelians and the Platonists are doing, namely coming together to hear read, you know, the wisdom of the ancestors, in their case, Plato's dialogues, Aristotle's treatises, in the case of the Christian monastery, the Holy Scriptures. Uh, but then, you know, in that, that doesn't stand alone as a discourse that is part of your life, separate from other parts of your life, but rather it is part of a communal uh, practice. Uh, so in other words, I mean, you know, and then, you know, his other book that uh, I've spent the most time with is actually called Philosophy as a Way of Life. And, you know, what he argues, and, and this has really kind of revolutionized the way that I think about what's going on with St. Paul's letters, the way that I think about what's going on with the Synoptic Gospels, uh, is that, you know, that discourse that arises, that interpretive discourse that, you know, the philosophers would have called dialectic, but becomes something more like oratory or homiletic in the Christian tradition. And listeners, this is what I was talking about. I go nerdy and I don't realize what I'm doing, but I just had a, a moment of self-awareness. Sorry. But um, getting together around these texts, right, 
uh, is not the end of the story, but it is a central part of the story that is involved with also living together and holding each other, you know, to a certain way of life, to a certain standard, to a certain account. And what it made me realize is that not only is there a lot less different distance, pardon me, between the patristics and the New Testament period, but also there's a lot less distance than I used to assume before between Platonic Stoic communities and Christian monastic communities. So, I mean, you know, one of the things that, again, you know, uh, sometimes I catch you guys saying, and I mean, I understand why you go this direction, is you'll say things like, you know, this isn't just poetry, this is Christ. And I'm thinking, why are you down on poetry? I mean, that, you know, the, <laughs> you know, one of the things that, uh, you know, I have learned again over the years, you know, largely from, you know, Robert Alter, who is a Jewish, uh, you know, writer on biblical texts. Uh, is that it, it's precisely in the literary narrative character, it's precisely in the poetic character of the biblical text that, and he wouldn't say it this way because he's got different theological concerns than I do, but I'm going to say that it's precisely through those vehicles that God gets to us with some of the best stuff, right? So don't be down on poetry, don't be down on philosophy, say, yes, Christ brings all of that in just as he brings in all of the nations, right? When we say that Christ brings in all of the nations, you know, like we see in Revelation, like we see foreshadowed in the early chapters of Isaiah, that includes, I think, the literature of the nations, the thought of the nations, the ways of life of the nations that lead to that fully human life that you guys so rightly talk about. All right, I'm preaching now. What do you guys think? <laughs> Those are, those are some great comments. I'm going to let uh, Ethan uh, start and then I'll jump in. Is that all right? I mean, I can, I can go. Fine. You... fine. Uh, first, thanks, Nathan. Um, so let me, yeah, let me clarify a couple things that I sometimes say. I'm not down on historical approaches to scripture. What I find is a lot of people who, <clears throat> excuse me, who do what we call historical criticism, but they do it with theological interest. They're not actually historical enough. Yeah. And yeah. so what Same I, more, I that's very, so, so, you know, I'm, I'm going after the NT rights. I'm going after the, the uh, Michael Gormans and these guys mm -hmm. who generally I would like, except for the fact that I don't think they picture the biblical writers standing towards their own words, like Paul, for instance, in the way an ancient mm -hmm. person stands towards their words. They present these guys like their 19th century German theologians relating sure. to their words in those ways. And so there's some more historical work. So like, for instance, I once argued that Alan Siegel, who was a, this Jewish scholar of pre-Rabbinic Judaism, he has a far more convincing case for the Trinity in Paul and salvation as theosis in Paul than anything a, a Christian Bible scholar like Michael Gorman puts out there precisely because mm -hmm. It's, it's just more historical. But then when you get there, you recognize this thing you say that like Pierre Hadot points out, the way ancient people stood towards their words was really different than how we as modern scholars do. Yes. So what happens is sometimes like, one, so I don't make those, those, those arguments against biblical studies as a patristics guy. I actually, mm -hmm. deep in my soul, there's a, you're not historical enough guy. Yeah, sure, um, sure. So, so, I mean, that's just the nerdy underside of Mysterion we don't normally talk about. Um, <laughs> so, so those shots are, the, I think, scriptural theologians in, contemporary, in the contemporary church who, who have mm -hmm. theological concerns. Um, I think they've gone down a bunny trail, and they're not actually historical enough. And the patristics, they model kind of on their sleeve this different relationship to, to words, which is ascetical mm -hmm. and spiritual. Right. which I think better history is also pointing out and that we have to recognize that the, the way sometimes they present the biblical writers, their relationship to their own words is itself anachronistic. So I don't mm -hmm. make that case in Mysterion just because that's quite a, a bunny trail. Um, yeah. And, and, and the, the philo the, and then the, the claims about philosophy, then, you know, like I, you know, most of my scholarly research was philosophical theology Mm -hmm. but precisely getting into the stuff you begin to realize like, you know, 
the patristics really aren't doing philosophical theology. Neither was Plato, right? As you rightly pointed out, as we think mm -hmm. of it in the modern world. So it's like a corrective. And I think you're right to kind of call us on that on some level, like, you know, you have to be clear. But so, so much of the conversation assumes, if you look like the blogosphere of how people interact with somebody like Gregory of Nyssa, they try to present yeah. him as this like, champion philosophical theologian with just smarter metaphysics than anybody else. When in fact, it's more like what Pierre Hadot says. In fact, Plotinus was not quite like that either, as you pointed out, right? This pagan mm -hmm. neoplatonic. So it's that kind of corrective. Um, so I appreciate that. And then um, that you pointing that out and that gives us a chance to kind of clarify some of that. Oh, sure, sure, um, sure. And like I said, I mean, you know, it, it hasn't kept me from listening to your show. So, I mean, please right. don't take it as a, you know, a, a, a condemnation by any sense. But uh, yeah, like I said, I mean, I, I think that again, and I see it in myself too, by the way. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm not pointing this out as, you know, the, uh, the one standing on the platform saying, I thank you, Lord, that I'm not like those bozos. <laughs> That's a loose translation. Uh, but, you know, I, I definitely see in myself when I drift into you know, theological conversations, especially with people who are deeply embroiled in what I call the guild. Uh, and when I say the guild, I mean, I'm using a medieval term, I realize, but I mean, it's, it's the AAR, it's the SBL, it's the people, again, who make their careers and get their tenure by ferociously de defending certain intellectual territory, right? Mm -hmm. And I've picked up some of those habits myself. And like I said, I think one of the things that I can bring to people who are trained in that arena. Um, and, you know, I mean, I've had conversations with people who say, you know, that's one of the things they appreciate about the way that we do things over at the Christian Humanist is that I want to find the good stuff in all of it and, you know, start with that and then say, okay, you know, over here in the corner, this thing I'm not going to go with, but by and large, this is the good stuff that they bring. And I think most of the time you guys do that, I just wanted to bring in, you know, the uh the marginal cases yeah yeah, yeah. I, I, oh, I was sorry i was just going to say that i think that you, um, you're right to call us out on that i think one of the one of the things that um uh, i'd want to clarify as well is oftentimes when those when those um statements come out of my mouth i'm i'm mm -hmm. thinking about those terms in their it, what i see is their commonly assumed territory you know sure um, sure I see, I see the current way in which people are trained to read scripture um, as, as really fractured. You know, um, we have mm -hmm. the biblical scholars that approach things this way, and then we've got the systematic theologians who approach things this yeah. way, and then we have the literary people that approach things this way, right? Um, and um, when I say something like, uh, this isn't poetry, you know, I'm usually trying to, <laughs> I'm usually trying to point to not, it's not this fear, it's this fear. I'm not doing that. I'm actually trying to yeah, say yeah. there's something going on here that it, it crosses those spheres mm -hmm. or right. it is in some sense transcends the distinctions that we assume are there. Um, and then, the, and, and then the English professor driving around is saying, why are you down on poetry? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Right. Poetry so I, is freaking awesome. Yeah, right, 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 right. <laughs> and I do think that sometimes, sometimes when I speak, it, it does tend to be, it, it takes a kind of uh, dialectical form. It's not this, it's not this. Mm -hmm. But actually, yeah, what, yeah, I, yeah. what I'm trying to point to is something much more synthetic, much more, um, you know, trying to attempt to draw these things together. There is, mm -hmm. uh, but I, I guess what I would say, this is something I've I guess it wanted to encourage in a, a more constructive way is not just that these things mm -hmm. are brought together in an interesting fashion, but what the father uh, present is a form of life whereby these things are not just integrated in a haphazard way, but mm -hmm. there actually, there is a kind of order and a pattern and a form that doesn't just bring insight, but it brings spiritual healing. So, so for example, um, you know, on the literal, if we're going to go back to origin, you know, we've got that literal level and we might be able to use all of these different ways of approaching the literary level, the, li the literal level, sorry. Um, and some of those might be informed by historical critical uh, approaches. Some of them might be uh, informed by, you know, uh, uh, you know, 14th century literary criticism. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. 
But at the same time, we're not just, it's not just a haphazard free for all. We're just going to take all these different approaches and see what happens. There's actually a, an aesthetic form where fundamentally all this stuff on the, on the deepest level has to be transformed by the, ex, by the aesthetical experience of dying and rising. And, th and that has mm -hmm. a particular form to it. It, it, it. it is in some sense definite or determinate, although not in an exclusive way or not in a confining or constricting way. Um, I do think the fathers say there is a proper way of approaching scripture. And, mm -hmm. and so for me, while I want to be synthetic, while I want to draw together all these voices, I do want to encourage at the same time what I think is modeled by the fathers, exemplified by the fathers, which is that there is a kind of uh, an appropriate way of reading scripture that does in fact reveal in its holiness. It does reveal it to be scripture. It does show it to be scripture. Um, and again, that's not, shouldn't be, uh, I'm not speaking of that in an exclusive way or an exclusivist way, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but in a way that is, a, I would say, um, uh, just trying to help people, just trying to help myself in a kind of maybe oh, sure, therapeutic sure. way. Like you wouldn't, you know, I see reading scripture in a very a sort of a, 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 in a therapeutic way, you know, like I, I wouldn't want to go to a physical therapist and say, well, we could try this and we could try this and try this and see what happens. It's like, well, no, like I want to be healed. And so there are better ways of doing this and I, I want to engage in that way, that manner of, of approaching scripture. So, Right, right. And, and, and what I would say in response to that is that my approach, I mean, uh, I'm not denying that you guys are using historical research, uh, resources or research for that matter. But I think that my approach is probably a little bit more historicist. And by, by, the, by that, I mean that uh, I want to hold the forms that you talk about where they relate to each other right uh to be tentative in some sense that an ancient reader wouldn't necessarily see as tentative right so i mean you know for instance um i'm going to go to a different set of texts and then backtrack to the scriptures uh you know by some weird consequences i have become sort of a a a mentor figure to uh emmanuel college's black student union and so, you know, we spend a lot of time together reading James Baldwin, Malcolm X, Martin Luther King Jr., and so on and so forth. And, you know, one of the questions they mm -hmm. often bring up when we talk about these texts together is, you know, I mean, can these writers still speak to us 60 years later because so many things are different, right? I mean, you know, uh, you know, a couple of them, you know, are married to white women and, you know, they say, all right, you know, Malcolm X, I mean, would absolutely be horrified by that. Um, can we still learn from him? And, you know, what I try to say is that I'm not a progressive. I don't think that every change that occurs over the passage of time is a good change. I want to reserve the possibility to say that certain changes are bad changes and here are the reasons why. I do want to say, though, that I'm a historicist in that, you know, when we consider a potential change or a change that is occurring or a change that has occurred, that we should be able to reason about the character and the value of those changes, right? And here's where it comes into scriptural reading, right? I think that, uh, you know, when we talk about, again, the approaches to scripture that, you know, you see in Clement and Origen and Augustine, since I've been bringing up Augustine, one of the things that, you know, one of the, what I would call a shortcoming, uh, is that when they go allegorical, they tend to go to a very individualist psychological space with it. It's a tendency. It, it's, a, it's a tendency. And I think that one of the correctives that modern biblical scholarship can bring to it, it doesn't always, is to bring it more towards a communal or, you know, broadly speaking, in an Aristotelian sense, a political approach to it. All right. Now, I want to go ahead and say that I don't mean that uh, you know, we should read scripture looking for the pl the planks in the DNC platform. That's not at all what I'm after here. But I will say that, you know, when I read, for instance, uh, you know, Walter Brueggemann uh, writing about Israel, right? I see things about a contingent, historically changing community that I don't always see when I read the Patricia, Patricia, blah, 
patristic writers. Easy for me to say. Sounds like those are fighting words, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Man, I, if, if, if those are fighting words, I mean, I, I, I feel like I was very restrained there. <laughs> oh, I'm just, I'm just playing around. Ethan, uh, do you have any, uh, what, you have any uh, thoughts on responding to him? Uh, well, thanks. I have too many thoughts to fit in, frankly, in this. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, it's different. You're reading Walter Brueggemann, and that's mm -hmm. quite different than what you get from the patristics. Um, sure. It's, you know, that's a reason why I, do, I just don't think it would be viable right now for academic theology to do a sort of patristics only. You know, the, the, the battlegrounds you talk about, you sometimes see in theology, I think that's yeah. really problematic. I do think Absolutely. That's, that's beginning to break down. Um, it, at least from the direction of some historians who talk about reception history, like they study scriptures through reception history, and some Very of that good. breaks down. Um, some of the theologians still, unfortunately, um, they either try to go ahistorical through appeal to some kind of philosophy that lets them do that or something. Yeah. But what Brueggemann's doing is different, um, and, and perhaps rightly so. You see the political dimensions that can be super helpful for precisely the reasons you name. I totally agree with that. Um, you know, we don't do everything on Mysterion that is everything we do. It's a kind sure. of a focused thing. Oh, yeah, yeah. But I would say, you know, the, I, I would challenge this idea that the, I would say when people today sometimes run to allegorical or spiritual interpretation, it's individualized. Mm -hmm. I would say the, the, the profound opposite in the ancient world. Uh, I mean, maybe Augustine does, maybe, but like, this is again something we can't get into today. Augustine, as far as his reading strategies, he's really an outlier in the patristic era. That's not talked okay, about. Okay. He is a, He's considered a revolutionary. Um, um, oh yeah, yeah. Historians in how he reads, um, and they I mean that in a good way and in a way it's like, well, but like, so I guess perhaps where you see like psychological readings, those are always already liturgical readings, so they're mm -hmm. communal in that way, because the 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 threefold of like a microcosm, macrocosm of like heavenly temple, temple below, temple within is mm -hmm. so pervasive in that world that when you're talking about the movement into the heart, you're also talking about the movement to the Eucharistic table <clears throat> mm -hmm. for a church that's at the heart of a city that's ordered in certain ways. And so I would say, if we're going to be fully historical about what they're doing in those spiritual readings, they're mm -hmm. always already liturgical. They're always set in the church with its ordered life. And so I can see why it often gets received in the modern world and then reappropriated in these sort of individualistic ways. Um, mm -hmm. But I don't think that is a truthful accounting of what you see there. There is always a correlation between what is unseen in the eternal world, what is seen in the church, and what is unseen in the human being who is engaged in reading. And they're always mm -hmm. ramifying off each other. And, and of course, religion was public in the ancient world. It's not this private thing. So, sure. so spiritual readings, um, there's a way in which they do kind of pull back from the political in the sense of um, fleshly, like the, 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 the fights over the world's goods, but not in mm -hmm. a modern private sense. Um, and that's a long, long conversation. Oh, sure, sure, sure. Um, yeah, and I, I didn't expect a full... <laughs> <laughs> like yeah. I said, it was a tendency I spotted, but yeah, I, th right. I think you're right about that. And, um, and oh, so, sorry, yeah. Sorry. so, so yeah, I mean, some of those things are there that you name exactly. Uh, but some of it also is like, I think the way we appropriate the fathers, we, when we receive their mode of spiritual reading outside of it, it's always a churchly context. And the church mm -hmm. itself is always a representation of the whole world ordered around God. And that, that that begins to change <clears throat> how those things are understood. So I just an individualistic reading in those in those figures, that's a hard pill to swallow. I don't think that's that's okay. that's accurate. But is it all and, and, and hearing you, Ethan, I mean I, I'm realizing that I'm probably reading Dostoevsky novels into origin. Because I, I, I think of the scenes, for instance, in Brothers Karamazov, where you know, uh, you know, we as the readers are confronted with the suffering of children and with, you know, the tyranny 
uh, that pervades that world and so on and so forth. And then we get, you know, a figure like Zosima and, you know, brothers Karamazov who says, well, you know, all of that is just my sin and, you know, it's all just, you know, my sins pervading the world. And, you know, as the reader, uh, you know, often in those passages, I kind of float over to Yvonne's camp and I say, yeah, but it's not really, it's, you know, there's actually more going on there than just your own individual sins, Zosima. So, I mean, but hearing you just, just now, I, I realized that I think what I am doing when I, I'm hearing you guys, I mean, before this episode, because I usually my car stereo doesn't speak back to me, but you are right now, uh, is that I am reading that individualizing tendency that I see in certain, well, I mean, Dostoe, Dostoevsky novels, let's be, just be honest. I think I'm reading that into what I'm hearing from you guys about origin. Wes, you're muted. I, one of the things I would want to add to this is I think that there, there's a distinction that should be made between individualizing readings or individualist readings and um, self-involved readings. I, I think that um, what we have with a lot of, especially the, 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 those that we turn to in Mysterion, the, the, they are monastic writers and uh, mm -hmm. part of what they're doing when they're reading scripture is it's in, in as, as you mentioned with Hodo, it is a, it is a form of life and the reading, mm -hmm. their reading and their writing is inextricable from their pursuit uh, of holiness. And in that way, mm -hmm. it has to be uh, uh, radically self-involved. And I think that um, that is different than if you think about at least classically um, those who write on scripture that publish on scripture today, like a Walter Brueggemann, he's, he's, mm -hmm. he's writing from, from the, from an academic platform. And sure. And I, I'm not going to say anything about Brueggemann's own personal intentions. I'm not, I, 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 I can say nothing about that, but, right. but the literary the, context matters. But the context is that he is producing these texts, these interpretive texts. Yes. One from, every five months. <laughs> yes. Right. And, and, and you have to think about the fact that biblical scholarship as it's borrowing this new way of approaching the, the um, historical critical method is borrowing a new way of looking at how to investigate the world. It is, um, systematically, um, how do I say it? Uh, bracketing questions of uh, self-involvement or, or the, the, my, the self-involved character of knowledge is in some sense mm -hmm. um, intentionally set aside. Right? We're trying to get objective here, right? Sure. Um, we're sure. going to try to approach the scripture as a scientist would approach, um, uh, you know, uh, artifacts of history or nature. And mm -hmm, so I mm -hmm. think that um, what, what, what's easy for us to do is see this intensely self-involved character of monastic interpretation and to read it as an individualist. Um, when we have to say, you know, if, if, a, if a monastic is, is, pursuing, uh, is pursuing holiness, the first question is, if I'm going to give voice to an interpretation, right, mm -hmm. I'm not going to bracket myself from that right i it's it but at the same time i'm not going to make my personality center uh, central either there's a sense there's a kind of an aesthetic right, humble right. self uh, renunciation that's taking place that is it involves the individual in an intense way but it's not individualistic at all you know um and so i do think that i do think that that dynamic paying attention to that dynamic is is an important one. And I think it is insightful for us as well, because I, again, for me, the primary question is, is what way is scripture holy? And how do I, how do I, in my pursuit of holiness, um, participate in this, right? Um, not only in the stories that are, uh, that are being communicated, but also in the very act of reading. How do I participate in Christ's holiness in this way? And it has to be self-involved. And so that's why I, I uh, emphasize what I do when I talk about spiritual reading um, at the same time, trying to resist uh, ways in which that can be skewed into individualism. That's good. That's good. Well, at any rate guys, I mean, that, you know, I, I, I know that at the beginning we, uh, we kind of agreed that we'd try to stick under an hour and I've already violated that. So I apologize, but uh, you know, any other points that you guys want to bring up or, you know,
um, you know, we haven't dug into, you know, uh, any particular text of origin, but, you know, I think you guys have been doing that very well over these last several weeks. So, uh, you know, I've, I've had the luxury of just kind of building off the work you've already done. I, I one, I, I want to say I've really enjoyed our conversation. Yeah. It's been fun. Me too. Yeah, it's been really good having you, Nathan. We, we appreciate you taking the time to do this out of your busy teaching schedule. <laughs> Very good. I personally think that, you know, we could say uh, this is probably a good place for us to lead up, leave off and, and uh, if we can have you on again to talk some more about some of these issues, I would love to. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, any, anytime you guys want to have me on, I, you know, I really enjoyed today, so I'd be glad to come back. Yeah. And I really want to let our listeners know that it really is worth checking out the Christian Humanist podcast in the 30 or 40 other projects you, you named that go along with it. <laughs> Um, uh, I'll say again, I love the interviews. They're so good. Um, thank you. Thank you. You guys have are phenomenal as well. It's really worth listening to. And, you know, and the other thing that I would say, something that came out here is like, you guys like cover all these different areas and that's, what's great. Like mm-hmm. Mysterion is like hyper specialized what we do. Yes. And people should try to get a broader view of some of the other conversations in Christian humanist is a great way to get at those, I'd say. So Yeah, and, and I'll also say that if you want to hear, I mean, if you're sick and tired of me, I totally understand. But if you do want to hear some uh, conversations, you know, from that show, uh, a lot of the recent episodes, uh, especially in 2019 and 2020, uh, when David Grubbs has been at the helm, have been about uh, patristic texts, whether commentaries or epistles or whatever else. So, uh, you know, I mean... Uh, what, as Ethan said, we're not specialized the way that, you know, Mysterion is. So, you know, usually we take on, you know, maybe a 10 page text instead of, you know, 600 pages on the first two words of the gospel of John. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we do, uh, dig into that kind of thing. And, you know, like I said, if you want to hear, uh, one of the Christian humanists, you know, give actually two of the three Christian humanists give a lot more, uh, you know, I don't even know what to call it. Uh, readings that resonate better with what's going on in the patristics. Michael and David are far more patristic oriented than I am. Uh, I'm usually the gadfly in those episodes. So, uh, you know, I guess if you enjoyed what you hear today, there's more over there if you want more of it. All right. Well, great. Thank you, Nathan. Yeah. Thanks, All Thanks right. everybody for listening. Uh, we'll be back to our regular format next week, getting into the song of songs through origin, which we're excited about. Awesome. And uh, in the meantime, uh, it's Easter season. I think, uh, well, probably still Lent for our Eastern listeners. But um, but hey, everybody, wherever you're on the journey, we're all together. And I hope everybody has a good week. Blessings. <laughs>